So thank you, everyone. My name is Sylvia Von Alamach. I'm the Executive Director at Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission. You're here on the exciting topic of tiny homes on wheels. I just want to thank Max. Max, stand up. Have you ever known a high school student to come to a legislative outreach event? Thank you, Max. You have brought our average age down a little bit. Thank you. Um, and we have uh, college students. Uh, we have, and let's uh, first and foremost, we have the legislative event and outreach event to celebrate those who dedicate their time and effort and energy to uh, helping us all in the state and uh, move policies forward. So if you're um, with the Senate or the House, could you please stand or raise your hand and be acknowledged? So thank you so much for coming and for your time. Um, also for our uh, Southern New Hampshire Planning Commissioners, if you could raise your hand and say hey. So again, thank you. I saw one of my own staff raise their hand. If you're part of SNHPC staff, please raise your hand and thank you for all your efforts. So one last uh, exercise program. There are many of you who are from our region, but many of you who are outside our region. And that's very unusual for one of our events. And so I would just a show of hands, if you're not in one of our 14 communities, could you raise your hand? So that means you're, you're not, okay, Auburn, Bedford, Candia, Chester, Deerfield, Derry, um, Gosstown, Hooksit, Londonderry, Manchester, New Boston, Ware, Wind, Windham, what did I forget? Fraserstown. So if you're not one of those towns, now raise your hand. So how interesting, this is how, thanks Joe for raising your hand, that's, and of course Ben, and you, and me. Um, but thank you all so much for coming. This is a really exciting topic. There are many of us who are sort of enthralled with tiny homes, whether it's if you're addicted to HGTV, like myself, um, and that's how you were introduced, or you're just looking for um, interesting alternatives to housing. So without any further ado, um, I just want to introduce James Vale. James is uh, one of our staff at the uh, Southern New Hampshire Planning Commission, and he suggested this exciting topic for tonight's um, topic. So thanks, James. Thank you everyone for the opportunity to be here uh, to speak with you. And in a moment, I'm gonna introduce our panelists. But first, I want to uh, share with you um, uh, a little uh, research I did on uh, the topic of tiny homes. So if you'll give me a second here, I'll just start my research. All right, so. Google search on uh, tiny homes and uh, instantly 20 million hits. So uh, people are talking about them and uh, it turns out tiny homes are available to purchase today. If you go on Etsy, you can buy someone's handcrafted tiny home for $32,000 or if you're more cutthroat, you can go to eBay and buy one and uh, we saw one on there for $58,000. So there's a multitude of uh, opportunities to buy tiny homes uh, through the World Wide Web, it turns out. Uh, in a quick search of uh, manufacturers in the Northeast, I found several companies that actually produce tiny homes in the Northeast. Uh, tiny House Northeast uh, here in New Hampshire is one of our panelists. Uh, Jamaica Cottage Shop in Vermont. Uh, tiny Homes of Maine in Maine. And B&B Micro Manufacturing in Mass. They're out by uh, North Adams. Very interesting. Um, one of the things that's really uh, curious to me is uh, how tiny homes became a phrase and how it uh, became uh, sort of part of the known language that we all talk about today, the same topic. Um, one of the things I found from looking on YouTube 
was that uh, there was a strong following for people who have uh, fully adhered to the tiny house lifestyle. And so I wanted to uh, emphasize a couple of those. Uh, th this woman uh, has a blog, a video blog, called Tiny House Giant Journey. And uh, every so many weeks, she posts a different short video uh, touring a different person's tiny house. There are uh, dozens, if not over 100 videos on here that you can check out. Um, this person has over 400 subscribers to her videos. And so every time she tours a new house, someone's getting a notification on their YouTube uh, subscription that uh, it's available. Uh, another person that's doing um, the touring of tiny houses is uh, living big in a tiny house, tiny homes, downsized designs and sustainable living. This uh, video blogger has over 1.2 million subscribers and so there's clearly a following for uh, tiny homes uh, that has gathered a following, so to speak. So, I went a little further and uh, I went into Google Trends. Anyone can do this. You just Google Google Trends and uh, you can type in any phrase you want and find out how that word has been searched through the Google search bar over time. And so what I've done is I put in the term tiny house starting back in January 1st, 2012, going up to January 1st of 2019. And what you see here is this is a relatively flat and then in just a little past February of 2014, it spikes up pretty quick. Uh, the top of this uh, is, is the scale for this is zero to 100, where zero represents no searches for the term, and 100 is the maximum number of searches that happen in a given month. So as you can see, uh, 2014, the term kind of spiked and then uh, bounced around up pretty high for a while there. And uh, it turns out that uh, uh, February 2014 is the month uh, that uh, Home and Garden Television released Tiny House Hunters, a television show. It's now on its fifth season and has millions of viewers. And so uh, we can pretty clearly see that uh, the Tiny House lexicon is really born out of Home and Garden television shows. I uh, just want to bring up real quick another thing in terms of uh, how this is impacting our economy. Uh, this is Tuxbury Tiny Home. It's just a vi little vignette of four different, um, they're like uh, uh, little hotels you can rent right here in New Hampshire. They're little tiny houses. So this summer, if you're feeling adventurous and you want to uh, spend a weekend in a tiny home to see what all the fuss is about, you can go to Tuxbury Tiny Home and rent the Henry and uh, get the industrial experience or go to the Murphy and know what it's like to live in a, a navigator's dream tiny home. And with that, I would like to introduce uh, our, our uh, panelists today and get started with the presentation. Uh, our first speaker is Lisa Bauer. She is the project manager and lead designer for Tiny House Northeast. Uh, ICE's custom design work and project management encompasses all aspects of tiny houses, from design building for the aging, disabled, and chemically sensitive, to materials choices and resources from space efficiency to utility systems, <coughs> and from municipal zoning to off-grid options. Um, her role as project manager, she affords uh, the opportunity to communicate with hundreds of anxious but hopeful tiny home buyers, broadly informed on the multifaceted subject um, of tiny houses. ISA has presented in dozens of MAP, Maine, and New Hampshire libraries, schools, and professional organizations from Seattle to Providence. ISA, uh, ISA, uh, my, excuse, my excuse, excuse me for that. It's uh, pronounced ISA. I, I've uh, been trying to eat this out of myself all week. So, um, uh, ISA has also served on her town's planning board as well as served on, as chairperson for the energy committee in, in her community. Uh, in graduate school, she spent much of her time researching and sharing information about green building, renewable energy, and other sustainability topics via the radio show she produced, The Long View. Uh, upon graduating, she focused on the development of green focus and building trades businesses. Our next speaker is Joe Mendola. Uh, he's the senior advisor investment for investments in real estate with NAI Norwood Group out of Bedford, New Hampshire. Uh, the sale of income-producing properties, Joe's focus. He provides brokerage services in uh, 
Manchester, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine uh, for investors looking for income producing properties. Joe holds uh, a BA from Ryder University and he's the senior vice president at NAI Norwood Group uh, where he has been employed since 1975. Joe has managed every aspect of real estate acquisitions and development <coughs> projects uh, for Norwood clients in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, in uh, Massachusetts, New Hampshire since 1982. In addition to developing over 35 million in commercial properties during his time, Joe has completed a wide variety of commercial brokerage assignments that range from industrial, retail, office leasing, uh, as well as sales of uh, these type of properties. Uh, Joe is a member of uh, New Hampshire Self Storage Association Board of Directors in um, the National Association of Realtors. Joe is also a re representative for the Town of Warner on the Kearsarge Regional School Board. And then our final panelist uh, today will be Ben Croft. Ben is the uh, Director of Legal and Public Affairs for New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority, also in Bedford, New Hampshire. Ben is um, uh, at, at the Finance Authority. He coordinates federal and state legislative initiatives and serves as an internal legal counsel. He frequently lectures on issues of affordability and workforce housing, uh, land use uh, law, and ethics. Ben ha has... Um, um, over 30 years of experience as a land use planner and over 20 years as an attorney. He is a founding member of the Governing Council of uh, Housing Action New Hampshire and a low income housing advocacy organization, which is a low income housing advocacy organization and for 10 years has served on the New Hampshire Energy Efficiency and Sustainable Energy Board. Ben as the tre is the treasurer for of both the New Hampshire Planners Association and the Northern New England chapter of the American Planning um, Association. Ben holds a BA and an MA degree um, in geography with a focus on USSR environmental policy. That's an interesting, maybe a topic for another, another day. <laughs> <laughs> From Colgate University and Syracuse <coughs> University, respectively in a, uh, respectively, and uh, he also has a law degree from Cornell Law School with a concentration in business law and regulation. He lives in New Hampshire, uh, Warner, New Hampshire as well, where he serves as the chairman of the planning board. And in his spare time, Ben, he and his wife, uh, Christine, seek to employ permaculture principles in the design of their woodland paradise. And with that, I'd like to invite Issa to come up and uh, share her, her panel discussion.
So why would you build one of these at all if you could just have a camper or a mobile home? Well, stick built wood structures have lots of different appeals to people. And well, you can read, but you know, year round living is completely possible as opposed to an RV or a camper, right? And that's what we're generally building. So that intention of being in it any time during the year, whether that is 365 days or not, that's another story. Uh, interior health, the ability to choose materials that are better for our health, especially in cases where people have asthma and different allergies, is wonderful. Larger environmental health, I mean, we're making things from wood, hopefully sustainable sources, and et cetera. Um, you know, customizability has, uh, is knocking on our door all the time uh, in terms of seniors and people with specific allergies to problems like that. And you know, we can really cultivate, cultivate a layout very specific to that person or couple or family with and without pets, with and without disabilities. It's very different that way and actually necessary because a tiny house on wheels is probably about, drum roll, about 200 to 250 square feet total, total. So now they do get a little bit bigger and some of the builders I think uh, accommodate folks who'd like have something 34 feet long, and, but I'll talk about dimensions in a second. And I think a very important thing for a, at the municipal interest level is that aesthetically they can fit in really nicely. You can have clapboard, you can have shingles, you can have actual wood, you can have a sense of an aspect ratio, height versus length as you look at it, that is a bit like a tiny house and not a mobile home. And so it's not that, uh, pardon the, like the trailer park vision of what these, you know, might be. It's not that. They're quite different. People are qualified, um, well qualified, pre-qualified themselves, self-qualified, to, to want to be in these tiny houses. When we've gone to shows, um, hundreds of thousands of people will come through to see it. Uh, very few of them actually buy but their curiosity has been piqued by these big old movie shows. And those who actually move to get one, who go in that direction, are people who've thought a lot about their carbon footprint, a simplicity in lifestyle, easy maintenance, um, uh, affordability, and um, you know, really think of the outdoors as their living room, which is quite different. You know, thinking about the outdoors as their living space. So maybe that 100 or 200, 250 square feet isn't so bad when you think of things like that. Now, sustainably, uh, we're, we can think about you know choosing materials even to the extent of not even finishing some things at times, like cedar, uh, possibly not ideal for the builder, but and for longevity. But the, there are options like that. Sustainability versus an RV uh, or a mobile home as a classic uh, example of those. They had formaldehyde in them. I guess they're not doing that anymore. But um, you know, metals, plastic, things that don't recycle very well, those materials don't need to be in a tiny house on wheels. And for many reasons, they're more sustainable, actually. We should expect to get the life of a, um, a regular house out of a tiny house on wheels. We really should. It's just that the tires might decay a little bit. <laughs> things might get a little, uh, go a little awry beneath them. But uh, the building itself should just last as long as any house if well maintained. So here we go. The dimensions are, we've got an eight and a half foot mat. So that is right at the edges of the roof, right out the edges of the wheelbox, the fenders of the trailer. That's eight and a half max. And then height, 13 and a half feet high. So nothing higher than that. So staying without the, within those restrictions and not lower than 40 feet, so no one Built to 40 feet, I think. Um, staying within those restrictions, you need really special permits and licenses. And then there's also the consideration of weight, and, and there's a little bit more to that. But generally speaking, um, an eight and a half by 13 and a half high, eight and a half wide by say 24 feet, which is common, by 13 and a half high can travel down the road. You just need the right vehicle. And in the case of 24 feet, uh, I be most comfortable, for example, with a uh, one-ton, maybe even a one-ton pickup truck or, or dual axle one-ton, okay? But oftentimes dual, um, or rather just a one-ton is fine for me. 
Now with these, uh, what makes them unique too is that every yeah. square foot is hugely important. And so I um, you know, can't emphasize enough how very, very custom these are, again, on a, on a customer basis. A couple of single, sometimes even roommates. I've, I've done a design with, um, it was for a farm, and there were two young ladies who tended the horses, and they were on two sides of the building, and they meet. And then they have this common area in the middle to, to put their miniature babies. But every square foot is super, super important in our designs, and, and any good design out there or builder out there will think hard about that for customers. So custom sizing, vertical space optimization, so we're thinking about going up the cabinets, all of that, uh, multi-purposing things. You guys have seen this if you watch the cable TV shows. How many people have watched the cable TV shows, please, in the tiny house room? One, two, okay, yeah. We've been in a couple, actually. Um, so you know that there are these benches that convert to, to tables that convert to beds that have drawers underneath and, you know, okay, you know that. So that's what we're aiming to do, right? Um, and then after that, we can add those aesthetic details, especially in the outside, that will make it pleasing for the neighbors to look at this building, you know, to enjoy it themselves. And that can be anything from really neat looking windows to, you know, breaking up the exterior cladding with, with maybe clapboard and shingles, as an example. Things like that really make a huge difference. Um, now, about building standards, I mentioned earlier that the tiny house on wheels isn't meeting the building code. We're still developing that, right? And when I say we, I mean collectively. We're all developing it. Um, I'm very frank person in all my presentations to say that we have tons of challenges. But um, there are a couple areas that we don't skip on ourselves. And when I'm consulted with do-it-yourselfers, I'm, I'm just as frank uh, or more frank. And that is that you know we're not going to need building code in six bedroom garages up the stairs. We're not going to need building code on the minimum living space either. You know, with a certain amount of square feet and a certain ceiling height. No, these things can't happen in this sort of dimension inside these buildings. Uh, but what, what we are going to do involuntarily is the life safety code, which is critical. So those things that will protect people uh, from harm, you know, be, be that the egress, be that alarms, be that, uh, you know, the, the electrics, all of those things need to be right on target. And then on our part, um, we have a system of bolts and braces, an uh, incredible, incredible amount of hardware. Uh, that not only bolts this to the trailer permanently, but assures a rigidity that's very unique. And um, I like to say that that's super important. Um, structural integrity is what I'm talking about. Maybe I should actually look at the slide. Now this is everyone's favorite. Um, so actually the utilities. Um, most often it works best when it's a complement of systems that work together. And honestly, our most popular toilet is, or way to you know, deal with, uh, with human waste, is the composting toilet. The composting toilet done correctly um, is as innocuous as anything and in effect can be actually compost. It's compost in progress. It takes a long time to pass it in through in there, but as a mix of the human waste and peat moss, as an example, um, you're creating a compost in progress. And um, another thing that people do is sometimes, you know, they'll have an RV style toilet, like a marine toilet, the same idea. And, you know, maybe they'll combine the two. Um, but there are things that folks do to combine these different technologies. One thing that I'm not a proponent of personally is this idea that any that our that our human waste would be bagged and disposed in the waste stream. Okay, no way. So the compost in progress or the composting toilets are actually very very effective. As far as water, that's probably the trickiest one. If we're not tying into the utilities because it's on wheels and in theory it's getting transported, right? So if we're not tying into the utilities, how are we getting our water? Well, if it was getting delivered, we'd be 
going through it like this. That'd be a very expensive endeavor. The water in it is an interesting thing. Again, we come to that, that, that idea that a complement of systems is the only way that will work. And so maybe we'll have stored water, maybe we'll have uh, rainwater, you know, we'll be doing uh, catchment systems, and uh, that, that's great. Now perhaps if we're lucky, uh, there's a nearby hose. The hose can be heated to uh, keep it from freezing. That's all, just like they have to water animals year round in a cold climate up here, right? So that's a possibility of tying into a hose with that particular amount of pressure and water. Um, heat as well, the complement of systems. Perhaps there is a backup generator, propane driven, and maybe propane uh, driven hot, uh, wall mounted heater as an example. Um, some people do wood stoves actually. slides, I'm used to having so many of them. I, um, I just want to say that it's, I realize this is a multifaceted, you know, and, and challenging topic to address, and we're all here to answer questions, and um, I want to thank you very, very much for hearing about this. Um, I, on my part, I'm, I'm very frank about both the advantages and challenges, so feel free to, to hit me up with questions. Um, I, present at libraries and universities and all, all sorts of places like that. So um, I'm prepared to be um, honest and informative. And that's it. That's our team, by the way. That's, that's our administrative team. We all have tiny hearts. Next, I'd like to invite Joe Mandela from NAI Noah Group to come and hand share some thoughts about the legislative possibilities of going small in New Hampshire. Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, I'm going to try to behave myself and stay within the time frame here. Uh, <coughs> but um, the whole, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to take the blame for this whole thing, the whole conversation. I started doing this about two years ago uh, when I found out that um, there was an affordable housing crisis in the state. And um, what I had learned after talking to my colleagues, my clients, and my customers, I'm in the real estate business, commercial real estate business, is that we do not have enough millennials staying in the state. We are not attracting enough millennials to come into the state to handle the greatest single positive problem that we have is filling about 1,800 advanced manufacturing jobs, starter house, starter uh, jobs and middle income jobs uh, because we have not been able to keep the uh, young people in the state. There's two reasons why young people do not either come to the state or stay in the state, and I can deal with one of them, I can't deal with the other. The first one is New Hampshire is not cool. Uh, I can't do anything about that. I think New Hampshire is pretty cool, as a matter of fact. Uh, the other is, uh, is the lack of affordable housing, and that's what I do. I solve problems. In, with real estate, and that's why I spent the last two years going to luncheons and breakfasts and meetings, and all that has happened is we've restated the problem and throwing our hands up in the air and saying we hope that the cities and towns will lower their regulations so we can get the cost of housing down. Well, um, that's not going to get the job done. So my wife said, Joe, if you really want to keep millennials in the state, sit down with me and watch the DIY channel and listen to these people who are buying tiny homes. And I said, you gotta be kidding me. She goes, sit down. So uh, after about the third show, I decided to DVR the whole series. And what I found is that every person uh, to a person were millennials. And um, so I said, you're, you're right. Um, so uh, what, what I am offering, what I'm trying to do, is to allow Tiny House on Wheels 
uh, to become a legitimate um, allowed use, and if, if my bill, HB 312, passes with your support, uh, we are the first in the nation primary state. We will be the first in the nation uh, that will allow tiny house on wheels as a permitted use. And that will get national appeal, and that will keep a lot of our millennial folks in the state and bring more in, which is what we really need. Um, so th that's what really got me going. And uh, what we need to do is we need to provide housing that our young people want. We're not talking about you know, father's mobile home, which we'll talk about that in a minute, but we need to think outside the box. And I have the unique um, position, because I'm such an old person, uh, to be present at the creation of the greatest high-tech boom in the Northeast, which is called New Hampshire. I, I lived in Marblehead at the age of 26, because it was cool, I'm with you, I was cool. Uh, decided at 26 to form a family, decided that needed a place to do that it was not Marblehead, Massachusetts, uh, but New Hampshire. So I came up to New Hampshire and I said, well, how can I make this thing happen? Well, at that time, there were two young professional entrepreneurs in the name of Sam Tamposi and Jerry Nash. And unless you got gray hair like me, you don't know these people that well. Uh, and they risked their time, their capital, and they went down to a couple of fellows at MIT called the Olson Brothers and asked the Olson brothers, would you expand your new high-tech digital equipment corporation in New Hampshire because it's a great place to live? Well, they sold them on the idea, and if you go to um, Continental Boulevard in Merrimack, you'll see a 500,000 square foot campus that used to be um, the headquarters of New Hampshire for Digital Equipment Corporation, at that time one of the largest computers companies in the world. It is now the back office of Fidelity Investment. And so I met another couple in Amherst by the name of Carl and Louise Norwood. And they had just got through selling what looked like the executive housing stock New Hampshire had to offer. And that was any straight front 1840 colonial they could find on the village green. Well, that ended really fast. So I'm in the world of demographics. We had a demographic, Carl really, and, and, and Louise realized we had a demographic problem. We have digital equipment coming up here. Silicon Valley guys with double E's and gals uh, selling $300,000 homes in, in, in California and no place to live. And so Carl and Louise said, and another person by the name of uh, Peter Flood, who did Jasper Valley, said, if we don't provide this housing, this will die. And so, with all due respect to the town of Amherst, I lived there for 35 years, I love the people, uh, we, we had to fight them tooth and nail because they had legitimate claims in those days and the claim is what is the claim that's used today by a lot of cities and towns, which is overpopulation in the schools. Well, that's not an issue today, I'll talk about that in a minute. But in, in those days it was, because we were tuitioning our high school kids to Milford, and, but we had a great, great elementary and middle school system. And so, um, uh, Carmel and Louise put on the table, we looked at it, and we built the first spec house in New Hampshire that cost over $100,000. And the word on the street was that was the beginning of the end of the Norwood Group. Well, to make a long story short, uh, Carl and Louise, uh, in the month of November of 18, celebrated 50 years of being in business. And uh, I managed Amherst Hills, which was the beginning of the demographic need, which was housing, and it wasn't affordable then, housing for the population at that time. And I sold uh, houses uh, from 175 up to a half a million dollars. Uh, like it was popcorn. Um, so I said to my wife, I said, wait a minute, why does this sound so familiar? So here I am, 42 years later, saying, we have the same demographic problem. No housing for the workforce of today. Just like we didn't have it for the workforce of 42 years ago. Well, the workforce today are our millennial friends. And so that's why we need to think outside the box. And thinking outside the box is we need to provide the product that our millennial friends need and want. They want, they want smaller, they want efficient, and they want it to be mobile because when I was graduating from college, I was told that you know if you change your job three times that in your career, that will be an average move for you. Well, uh, with the 
Norwood grew a good enough it is my third job so that worked out pretty well but these young people are being told that you will change jobs ten to fifteen times in your career and when they do that they they need to have the mobility to move and we've screwed it up me meaning my my generation has screwed it up for the young people because we we really have destroyed in their own minds the idea of if you buy a starter home when you graduate from school and you go out there and save your money that's how you build wealth that's what my parents told me I don't know about your parents so my parents tell me you tell that to Millennials today they said wait a minute my parents went through foreclosure my parents went through a short sale my parents have a house with no equity in it Joe thank you but I don't want to be tied to the housing cycle and that is another reason why tiny houses on wheels has such an appeal so what I did after two years of doing research and getting my head beat against the wall going from town to town talking to planning boards somebody had said geez you ought to try to manufacture a housing product zone and see if you can work through that well it did found out that it's controlled by HUD and has very specific regulations that are made for mobile homes this is as Issa said a tiny house is not a mobile home so what I said is here's what we need to do we need to create legislation that will allow the tiny house on wheels to be a permitted use in the state of New Hampshire now we have a manufactured housing park zone in the state that's statewide basically with with the help of I'm gonna I hope I don't embarrass him my friend here Ben was a bit was a big help to me we crafted HB 312 and what that does is it just takes RSA 674 31 and 32 that's geared to lock in manufactured housing controlled by HUD to free it up so that we can work with people like Issa and other other tiny home builders and create a parks because you can't put it in your father or your aunt's backyard we have just too big of a need so if we can create a manufactured housing park then we'll be able to provide the housing that people want so why tiny homes why do people want tiny homes well because they want to live minimally now I'm spending a lot of time with with these young people I love them they're great what a breath of fresh air and they're teaching me they're teaching me how they think and and their language so I said to one millennium well what is living minimally all about and he said Joe it's living large with less okay great we want new construction we want it to be affordable and you can buy a tiny home for somewhere between 45 to buy a luxurious one for up to 85,000 or more now the other part of the population we need to take care of in the state and they all come down and cry the managers and owners of our resort communities we have we have with our tourists we have great a great tourism industry and we price the hospitality workers and the people who run these these chairlifts and we price them right out of the market well if they can't find a place to live what are they going to do they're going to go down south and they're going to job down south and our, our businesses will go down south and follow them and we could kiss the business profits tax uh, goodbye uh, because the businesses will follow where the life workforce is in a 2.7 percent um, we're, we're not doing what we need to do to provide the employees for, for our, our industry which is just a, a great boon to the economy so um, the tiny house on wheels is, is what makes it happen and this is as it says this is not your father's uh, mobile home okay a lot of people want to attach it to the mobile home industry but it's it's not and uh, when I talk to the I go to planning boards and I talk to the town they give me the story of the, the mobile home park that was set up before zoning came in and it looks like uh, a not a nice place and and besides uh, our millennials don't want to live in a mobile home park they want to live in a community with other people that think like them we want to live large and and uh, think minimally and so if we can pass this legislation um, then we can make make it a permitted use just like a mobile home is and then we can provide the parks around the state that will keep the, the one part of the, of the millennial problem in the state and that's really affordable housing could you imagine living in a beautiful luxurious tiny home on wheels for eighty five thousand um, dollars it, it, it makes th this issue go away yeah okay. uh, so the, the key to the tiny
probably hung with him, but Lisa could probably tell you, is, is, is we store vertically, okay? Th that's what makes the house even bigger than what it is. And the, the, the wording that I'm using in my bill, I'm taking it right out of the page of, of the HUD requirement. I just don't have their seven foot ceiling in there. And it's basically an, uh, an eight by 40 foot permanent chassis on wheels. So that'll get you to 320 square feet, okay? Theoretically, a traditional a tiny house is somewhere between 150 and 400 square feet. Mm -hmm. But between 275, 320 square feet, we can get it all done. So you can see how, how things are stored uh, in, in a home. Now you're looking from the ceiling on down at a first class stainless steel, beautiful modern kitchen. It's in a tiny house on wheels. Um, there's another look at it. Uh, other things that we do, uh, we have three quarter baths. Um, and I'll take this one part. See this over here where the computer is? We have a Murphy bed system that we can use if you want living on one floor, sleeping on one floor. So the, the blue uh, uh, coverings at the top is, is, is a bed. And it, at nighttime it goes down, it goes up in the daytime, you put down a, a ledge, a chair, and you've got your office. That's how you make living large uh, with less. And so um, we are really uh, at, at the cusp of making this thing really happen. Uh, and as you can see at the end, uh, whether our millennial friends will hook up because they're working for Oracle Corporation here in Manchester and some Bitcoin company gives them a call and says, come out to Colorado and write some code for me. Uh, you gotta be out here in a month. So uh, whether they hitch that, that tiny home with 30 day notice to the park and drive out and they're in Ford F-150 or they just rent it to, to another, uh, another millennial uh, person, they're good to go. But they do not want to be tied to our housing center because we've done a really poor job uh, letting them know that there's, that there, there's some, some equity to be built up there. So, um, if, if, whoops, wrong, wrong guy. Okay. So, in, in, in closing, uh, HB 312 is going to come before the uh, uh, municipal and, and town committee. Uh, if we can pull this thing off, we will be the talk of the nation. And I believe very strongly that we will attract a lot of millennials from other parts of New England to come and work for Brundy, Velcro, and, and uh, uh, Sig Sauer, and all these companies that are desperately needing uh, these employees. Thank you very much for your time. Next up, we're gonna have Ben Frost uh, from uh, New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority come up here to help us demystify some of the existing legislation around housing in this country. Thanks, James. Uh, good evening, everyone. So you've had two really interesting, colorful presentations, and now you get the lawyer talking about <laughs> regulations. How, how exciting. But it is really exciting stuff. Um, how many of you are members of, of Plan Link? So PlanLink is the, it's a, the online discussion <coughs> forum, it's a listserv uh, maintained by the Office of Strategic Initiatives, um, unmoderated, but anyone can, can join it and it's, it's a discussion group about local planning and local regulatory issues. For the past two days, uh, because of uh, a question asked by my friend Scott Osgood, uh, PlanLink has been lit up with this discussion about tiny houses all kinds of things coming out. Some of them, some of them right, and some of them wrong. Uh, that's the way the, these discussions go. Um, but the fact is that, that this discussion on plan link is representative, I think, of a level of frustration at the local level, frustration of municipal officials at not knowing how to deal with tiny houses because there's no real guidance for them, and that's true. And so I commend my friend Joe for having uh, House Bill 312 introduced. Is that the solution? I don't know. Uh, it's, it's a start anyway. It, it, it is an opportunity for the legislature to start to grapple with this issue that municipal officials are already dealing with. So the fundamental question I want to ask when, when we're talking
talking about tiny houses is, does it have wheels or does it not have wheels? If the answer is no, then it's just a small house. It's nothing other than that. It's just a small, maybe a very small house. <laughs> it has to meet the state building code. It has to meet fire code and any local amendments to those codes. Could be your primary dwelling. You could have a, you could have a tiny house on 500 acres. You could have a tiny house on two acres. As long as it meets the zoning ordinance, then you have no problem. It could be a detached accessory dwelling unit if your municipality allows it. Note that some communities do have a minimum uh, a unit size standard. So uh, we, Joe and I live in Warner, uh, represented by Carson, uh, also from Warner. Uh, our, our building code in Warner requires dwelling units to have a minimum uh, size of 300 square feet. Why? I don't know. It's, it's just there. It's the standard. So anyone who wants to create a new single family home in Warner has to start at 300 square feet. Um, and other towns have uh, some occupancy standards. So is there anyone here from Durham? Durham. Uh, so, uh, does, do you know, does, I know that the Durham, Durham zoning ordinance has a size standard and I think it's 250 square feet per person in a unit. Yeah. Is it 250? Okay, so that's Durham. And you, Durham being the home to UNH, you can imagine why Durham wants to have that kind of standard. Um, so these are all the kinds of things that you have to deal with when dealing with a small home. Um, the, the International Residential Code, which is created by the International Code Council, uh, sets a baseline standard. Uh, the question, though, is which International Residential Code? The ICC amends it every three years. New Hampshire is on the 2009 suite of codes that were promulgated by the ICC, including the 2009 uh, International Residential Code. Um, so so that's, that's an issue. I know the legislature has been dealing with this for the past few sessions, and I think there's, a, there's legislation in again this year that would bring us up to the 2015 code, skipping over 2012. Uh, the ICC has promulgated the 2018 code, so they're, uh, they're ahead of us there. Uh, in 2015, with the 2015 International Residential Code, the ICC made a change to minimum standards. It used to be that uh, a, a dwelling unit would have to have a room of at least 120 square feet and any other rooms would have to be at least 70 square feet. And with the 2015 uh, residential code, they changed that. They, they said the, the minimum room size has to be at least 70 square feet. So you could have a single room house of 70 square feet that meets the international residential code. Uh, and what, why did they do this? Well, there was this fascinating uh, bit of information put out by uh, the, the ICC when it was releasing the 2015 Residential Code. And they said um, uh, that there were uh, advocates uh, who were, uh, who wanted to, you know, they were advocating for tiny homes. And what they were saying was that uh, the proponents uh, of minimalist living, that expression, minimalist living, this is the International Code Council talking about minimalist living, have advocated smaller dwellings to reduce environmental impact and provide lower living costs through reduced mortgage and maintenance expenses. And they recognized that the 120 square foot standard was not based on any scientific analysis. But they did do an analysis and they found that 70 square feet is really the minimum size you need to be able to use a space for which it is intended, that is human habitation. Uh, and so they went from an arbitrary restriction to something that is based upon some more objective standard. Uh, they also recognize that uh, there are, are a lot of um, uh, outliers out there, that is people who are living not under the code. And what they said was, it may also encourage greater acceptance of and compliance with the residential code by those pursuing a minimalist lifestyle instead of being renegades. So, uh, also on plan link has been this discussion of the 2018 International Residential Code Appendix Q. I keep wanting to call it Avenue Q, but um, we'll stick with Appendix. Um, and what the, the 2018 uh, code has done is it's updated. They came up with these standards for tiny homes. This is what Appendix Q is all about. And it's, it's about dwellings that are 400 square feet or less, meaning down to 70 square feet. So really between 70 and 400 square feet. But I 
I almost did it. Appendix Q applies only to tiny homes on foundations. It does not apply to tiny homes on wheels. Industry advocates are advocate, and they did in, with the 2018 code, uh, industry advocates, that is tiny home industry advocates, are pushing the ICC to adopt tiny home on wheel standards as well. So we will look for that with the 2021 iteration of the International Residential Code. So, that question again, does it have wheels? Yes, if it does have wheels, then, and it's, it's not built according to the, uh, what Joe talked about, the HUD manufactured housing standards, which were created by um, the federal government in 1974, recognizing these units were moving across state boundaries and states couldn't individually deal with them, so the federal government had to come in and create manufactured housing standards for safety, for, for habitation safety and for transportation safety as well. Um, the HUD standards say that in, for something to be a manufactured housing unit, it has to be of at least 320 square feet in size. Um, there's also uh, a recreational vehicle industry standard uh, which co covers uh, structures of up to 400 square feet, but these are different things. So it's, if it's a manufactured housing unit, it's manufactured housing. If it's not, and it's on wheels, then it has to be classified as a recreational trailer. And so the state law does deal with this in RSA 216.118C. Uh, it, it talks about uh, the limitations of recreational trailers. They are not intended for permanent occupancy. They're intended for temporary occupancy. That's the purpose of it. And it's not a reflection of the quality of construction. It's really, it's, it is a limitation on campgrounds, which is really where these things are focused and where this law is focused. Uh, but it's also to protect uh, manufacturers from liability. So manufacturers of recreational trailers will always say, not intended for permanent occupancy, uh, because they don't want people to have expectations that might not be realized by what they're selling to them. So then we come down to local zoning. Um, manufactured housing, since 1985, under state law, manufactured housing must be allowed in every municipality that adopts a zoning ordinance. Uh, and it can be allowed in one of three forms. Manufactured housing, on a single lot, manufactured housing in a park, or manufactured housing in a manufactured housing subdivision, which is different from a park. Is our tiny homes on wheels manufactured housing? Well, they could be if they were built according to HUD standards and had these dimensional, uh, met these dimensional requirements in the traveling mode that is on the road. They have to be at least eight feet wide and at least 40 feet long, or when assembled, have to be at least 320 square feet. If it's not manufactured housing, then essentially by state definition, because there's nothing else in state statute, it is a recreational trailer, but then it's only intended for, for temporary occupancy. And zoning ordinances under state law are not required to allow recreational trailers. Do you see the problem? There's no way to do this unless you're going to do it as manufactured housing. And I'll bet that ESA does not want to be, be building things according to a HUD manufactured housing state because you probably could, but you'd wind up with something very different from, from what you're building. Very costly. So the problem then is not only this lack of definition, but that there is no current code under state law in New Hampshire to yield something that Joe wants to do. We need to change this somehow. Um, so this comes then to the legislature, and the legislature has some issues that it will, will have to address if it is going to do something to solve this municipal problem. Uh, it has to choose an appropriate building code, uh, whether it's waiting for 2021 IRC and hoping that the ICC develops something for tiny homes on wheels, that's possible. Or choosing some other industry standard relying on industry experts to advise the legislature on, on what to come up with from a life safety and from a transportation standpoint. How are these things taxed? Oh, well, taxation. Well, we do rely on taxes in New Hampshire. Uh, certain ones, others not. Uh, if they are real property, 
then they can be taxed with the local property tax. But if they're not real property, meaning they're personal property, cattle, if you will, then they can't be taxed as, as real property. Manufactured housing under state law, and, and New Hampshire was the national leader in this, manufactured housing is real property. Even though it can be moved, it is real property. Why is that? One, taxation. Two, financing. You can get a mortgage in New Hampshire on a manufactured home. You can't get a mortgage on a recreational facility. You have to do UCC consumer financing at a much higher interest rate and terms that are not anywhere near as favorable as a mortgage. Um, if, even if it were uh, real property, uh, you might run into some sizing standards. Um, if, it's, if it's manufactured housing, FHA has certain requirements. Uh, uh, Fannie Mae has certain mm -hmm. sizes. I think 600 square feet. Why they come up with that, I don't know. So we have to deal with lending standards. We have to deal with the issues of foreclosure if these are to be treated as real property, as House Bill uh, 312 does. Um, and we need to compare that with how they're going to be treated uh, as opposed to manufactured housing. And then there's the whole thing about utility commission. And is that something that can be addressed properly in, in state statute? Um, I think that is probably all I want to say at this point. I know there's going to be lots of questions on municipal regulation, maybe some state law. I know that there are some state representatives in the group here, um, and would be happy to provide assistance as we move along through the process. So, uh, looking forward to questions. Thanks very much. Thank you very much to our speakers. They did an excellent job. Uh, we want to give an opportunity for people to ask questions. If anybody has a question, just raise your hand. Sylvia will make her way over to you, um, and we can get started. Or is there a different way of dealing with this? 
such as we deal with manufactured housing, we have the manufactured housing standards and installation board in New Hampshire, which, which deals with that for municipalities. I, I think it's a lovely idea. Uh, I, I think it's a wonderful idea for a town like Chester that has no um, uh, municipal infrastructure, no water or sewer, that's the big concern. The density. If I could, I'd like to, to address it. I've done a lot of research on this. Um, what we've patterned HB 312 after is, is after the manufactured housing park uh, zoning ordinance in Henniker. And Henniker calls out uh, uh, a plot of, of 10,000 square feet per unit. So, so basically, we're looking at, at doing about four to an acre. And uh, putting my real estate developer hat on, um, uh, we would basically put together a water and sewer system just like you would in a mobile home park. Uh, and so we would, you know, gang up the, the wells, create create a uh, reservoir system and a, and a septic system that would work. We have a number of manuf uh, mobile home parks in the state that are, you know, on, on well and septic. We do that. The other thing I want to bring up about the taxation, because I was going through this, uh, in my own hometown, uh, they, uh, they basically raised that as a concern. And I talked to... Um, Director Hamilton at the Department of Revenue. And he said, Joe, he says, uh, this has been settled uh, in the Supreme Court case uh, of Preston versus the town of Pelham in 1999. And I don't remember all four of them. I will, I will bring it to the, to the hearing before the legislature. Uh, but one of them has got to be, it's got to be permanent. It's got to be enclosed. It's, it's got to have two more things to it that a tiny house on wheels can, can do. And if you do that, you can uh, tax it as a piece of real estate. Uh, I, as the as the park owner, get a portion of those taxes for that. And the, in terms of the financing, uh, right now, uh, Lightstream, which is the largest subsidiary of SunTrust Bank, which has just become the sixth bank, largest bank in the country with a merger with PB&T, uh, does provide financing for tiny homes on wheels. And when I started 25 years ago uh, in the self-storage industry, um, again, this is like deja vu all over again. Uh, I went to get my self-storage facilities uh, financed, and the bankers would say to me, Joe, 300 one-month rentals, that's the collateral you're bringing? And I pointed them to the south, southeast, southwest. Uh, today, they call me and say, where's the next self-storage deal? Uh, so uh, the financing problem is, is being solved. It can be solved more talking to the uh, credit unions, but it can be, if it's a permanent dwelling, and we would, we would raise, we would raise the, um, uh, the um, chassis that it's on off the ground so that the wheels are, are not flattened, and we would secure it just like you would a mobile home. There's a whole industry of, of mobile home installers in the state. Uh, we would do it that way, and in doing it that way, because we don't want microblasts to take them away, your town can can uh, tax it as a real estate, real property. Other questions? Can I like to adjust this, please? <laughs> uh, a development is uh, you know, on occasion going to be the perfect antidote for this antidote. Um, however, a lot of people can't afford to be part of a typical development. The development is very expensive. Uh, for the typical buyer that we have. And uh, from that being postgraduates, uh, middle-aged, oftentimes middle-aged women, seniors. Um, so the idea of a mobile home park where they're also paying rent and buying the building um, is is its own thing, really, from um, what Joe was describing here, so to be clear. I'd like to put this out here while I have the mic, is that there might be a tax structure all on its own for tiny houses on wheels that meet the, that dimension criteria with the width and height and all that I had described. And in fact, you know, possibly on the basis of just the square footage. And um, 
you know, there's, there are different venues to park these and that the term is park and they usually stay there, so parking might be a little uh, misleading. But the fact is that the, I think that our, our folks, our townhouse fans, um, those who would like to do this, they understand that they're going to have to pay some kind of taxes. Uh, they really do. It's not trying to escape from taxes. But now it's up to the government to think of a fair way to do that. Thank you. Thank you for um, the presentation today. It's been very interesting. Uh, I live here in Goffstown, and I will tell you that there's a lot of interest in the industry, and it's sort of, it looks like TV is frightening the industry. Um, I can tell you in our community, we haven't had any inquiries about this. The inquiries are all coming from the municipal level, people who are in the industry, so to speak, but from a do we have something that can meet this? It has not been an issue. So um, I'm just putting that out there because I, I think it would be interesting for people to find out how much interest there actually has been in their community as compared to you know, people trying to solve the, the issue of housing. I did take a look at the bill while you were talking and I just, because I've got two people who were involved with the bill, so, and I probably won't be at the hearing, so I wanted to ask, it looks like this bill would make the allowance of these mandatory. If you have zoning, you will have to allow them, and I'm not, I don't have the manufactured um, housing park statute available, so I'm not quite sure. And then it does look like, so if you have, the intent would be if anywhere you allow a, a residence, you would allow a tiny home. And that the second part of this is a tiny is a tiny house park of at least four units in which no more than one of the units is the property owner. So it would appear that this is this tiny house park is really targeted to a rental market, which is I think is what you're saying you're targeting for millennial is you're telling me we, we have an up to four, but only one can be the owner. Um, and it would appear is discretionary as to, well, the community has to allow it. It says shall make, your municipality shall make a provision. It appears to be discretionary as to the septic and water in that the property owner has the discretion to use either um, individual or community wastewater and drinking system. So the discretion would be that the homes could then have the self-contained system that I think we serve the discretion of. So I, I just want to make sure I understand that we're talking about rental property where the owner has the discretion to not hook up to any community water or sewer. Um, and I, that would be enough of a clarification. My, I, I note that it talks about making sure firefighters can have access and that kind of thing. Um, I can see DPW with my access. And I complain about the access word right now, but if you could address that for me. Yeah, you, you, you've covered a lot there. Uh, <laughs> but again, it's patterned right after the, the, the manufactured housing part zoning that's at RSA 674-3132. Uh, and the, the problem that we have with the with the towns, I'll be very honest with you, is it's statewide zoning, and, and as uh, Ben noted, it's, it's clear across the state. What we have to deal with um, is, it's not talked about much in these conversations, we're residents of every different town, but we're also residents of New Hampshire. This is a New Hampshire problem, okay? Uh, 42 years ago, we fought the town of Amherst tooth and nail. They had legitimate complaints because it was a school issue. Right now, 15% of all our schools across the state are vacant. They're crying for the sustainable aid funds. So uh, if I could put an, another tush in, in the seat, uh, the towns get more money. But these millennials who are buying tiny homes are not in the pro process of, of forming families right now. I can, I can assure you of that. But in terms of the, the way I thought that we, we had uh, uh, talked about the zoning, is it would be what is available in the town uh, and I, I talked with DES, and, and the one that he used to came up with was the, the composting toilet uh, would, would really not be allowed in the state if water uh, was available. So my vision of the park would be to provide a community water and, and 
septic system there just like you would in another mobile home park but the uh, uh, so so you, you let me just I think there's one more thing that you raised that's really important um, oh the, the rental piece yeah don't forget the, the, the Millennials uh, the, we, we've taken away the, the, the joy of home ownership they don't want to they don't want to be tied down to the, the next uh, calamity that comes out of Washington DC and it turns the housing stock into a uh, tailspin. Uh, they need to leave in 30 days because that's where their next job is. Hey, technology's moved on. We, we, we have a problem. We have to deal with it. We can't make, make it kind of go away. So whether they hook, hook that, that home up to a Ford F-150 or they rent it to a friend of theirs who, who's coming into the area is really irrelevant. They want to have the ability to do that. So yes, um, they would be paying a park rent just like you would for a mobile home park. And, and then there would be, uh, to the extent that there's up to their eyeballs in student housing, which a lot of them are, uh, they would have to have some financing to do that. And I'm working on that with, uh, with Lightstream out of SunTrust Bank in Florida. So, Representative Griffin, you, you also uh, talked about the, the, um, uh, the, the local issue of, of you know, who, who's asking for this. Well, uh, so I'm, I'm chairman of the Warner Planning Board. Joe asked to do this. He came before the planning board, uh, was it a year and a half ago, uh, looking to do a tiny house uh, on wheels development in Warner, and um, I had the unenviable task of saying, you know, no, you can't do it. Uh, not under our zoning ordinance. And he went to the DBA and didn't find uh, much joy there either. Uh, so it, it was, and, and Warner's zoning ordinance is not unusual in this regard. I think, I think it's probably uh, not universally, but widely representational of, of the structure of zoning in New Hampshire with regard to tiny houses on wheels. Now, the other thing that Joe did in Warner was a, a great success, and it was a single tiny house. Uh, he calls it a tiny mansion. Uh, it's a beautiful small house on a permanent foundation, uh, and sold it for your asking price to a young couple, exactly the kind of people we want to have coming to New Hampshire and staying in New Hampshire. One day, full price, 2.0. But it didn't require any change to zoning. That, that was yeah, the, the, the reason why I got there. Microphone. <laughs> uh, my, my, <laughs> my neighbor is in, in Warner. Is if you re, manufactured housing park is allowed in, in Warner. But what they go on to say is you cannot put a house on wheels on an individual lot. So I was stymied there. The last show on the DIY channel showed a, a tiny mansion where a young couple said, I just got too much stuff. So the tiny mansion was twice the size of the tiny home, but it had to be put on a foundation, and the Warner zoning allowed that to happen, and it validated what I'm trying to say uh, with, with, this, with this bill. Uh, these people uh, almost gave me hugs and kisses that I built that home. So, uh, to the representative's comment back here, they're not asking for it in Goffstown, uh, but you know, I'm sponsoring this bill, and I've been inundated with emails because my name's on the bill uh, you know, from people saying, when are you going to get it done? You know, I have space to put it. of interest out there. I was really surprised when you got me into this. <laughs> I, you know, but uh, clearly there's interest here in this state. I do want to talk about the demographics. Um, the fact is that yes, these people have kids. They're planning on having one or two. You know, this is very common. And cat, dog, cat, multiples. Um, so don't don't think this is a you know a single or couple only issue too. This is these are people who will have children and in the school system. You know I know we've come back to taxes again too. This is a fair thing to think about this. Um, so I, I want to be clear on the demographics. Uh, I'm addressed specifically as both an educator and a design builder all the time. So I've fielded hundreds if not thousands, of inquiries. 
and i can tell you what that group looks like very specifically predominantly it's post graduate young people late twenty's thirty's they often have school loans still they tend to be educated college educated secondary school and post secondary and then we also have a huge segment of the interest are middle aged women who think about having something that's going to be a lot easier to maintain just by virtue of its size which is kind of neat so maybe not monetarily driven but maintenance driven and then finally older people seniors who may want to just put a tiny house alongside their main house and their children and grandchildren are living in the main house a small contingency are disabled people who are looking for something extremely customized to accommodate wheelchairs and allergies and that sort of thing an autistic boy once I had a young man that I've done some design for as well so those those are the demographics it's pretty broad it's pretty interesting that way Linda Coulart, Frankstown Planning Board a statement and a question Frankstown has had inquiries and why can't I have a tiny house and the answer is again because you can't you can you can you can park it someplace for a certain amount of days and then you have to move it or you can't and I'd like a clarification on exactly what the tiny mansion is is it was it on wheels in the foundation or it's not on the wheels it disappeared So the plan for the tiny mansion was on, on a foundation, it was 650 square feet as opposed to 320. And so uh, I, I did not run afoul of the uh, zoning and that's why we built it. Other questions? got student loans, that's my eyeballs. Went to great university in New Hampshire, which I love to death, but a lot of student loans. Uh, worked many jobs, one of them being teaching, so I don't make a whole lot, uh, but would love to live in a tiny home. And I just want to kind of ask you, it sounds like a lot of the bills centered around kind of having a tiny house in a development and a park and you're gonna have to pay rent. And one of the things I'm trying not to do when I want to build my own tiny house is pay rent. I just want to live in a tiny house maybe have on my own property or even pull it up to like a parent's property or something like that to save money. I, I'm not really interested in paying rent on top of paying to build my own tiny house. So I wanted to ask you if there's anything in the bill to allow it to be pulled onto another property like a parent or my own property. Thanks. Yeah, the way the bill is set up now, it's, it's, it's defined in terms of the park. And, and again, uh, you, you're, you're kind of interesting in, in your situation. I'm trying to solve a global problem here. I'm trying to develop a place where I can get 15, 20, 25 millennials to come and stay in the state. So the park, uh, which is which is already in place with, with the manufactured house, that same concept is there. I can't do a, I can do a onesie twosie, but it's not going to solve the problem for the people that uh, run the, the businesses and corporations in New Hampshire. Uh, so to to expand on that a little bit. I, the bill does, in part, address uh, how a tiny house on wheels would be taxed uh, on property of another. And there's this uh, special class of, of property taxation that is called property on land of another. And so you, you separate, in, in your tax bill, you, you separate the, the land from the, prop, from the, the structure, in this case the tiny house, uh, and it, you get separate tax bills. So it, there, there is precedent in New Hampshire law for, for addressing that. Uh, thank you, yeah, and also there is a lot of interest. Um, we just, as millennials, we don't necessarily know who to talk to, and we talk to some people, but then they don't actually know what the rules are, and they have to talk to somebody else, and it's, it's just something like a gray area right now anyway, so there is interest out there, and we just stay in New Hampshire because we love New Hampshire, but it's just hard to stay here with the housing. Um, prices have gone up so far, and it's hard to stay in the area. There, there are towns, I'm not going to name them, but you know we're, we're probably represented here right now. There are towns that have uh, some very, very lax zoning 
um, zone zoning at all. <laughs> and uh, you know, so when tiny house speakers uh, come to to me, um, my first thing is simply to say, please look online at some towns that you think you would like to live in, and refer as as a, as a reference, loose reference, to their policy around uh, mobile homes and RVs and campers as as a start. And so that's just, that might have been something that you did, right? You look online in the towns that you're interested in, and lo and behold, there are some towns that work. I just heard someone say grass and tongue. Yeah, I was uh, thrown out of the planning board. Of, I won't mention the name of the town, but uh, as I was going out the door, the most vehement uh, opposition fellow said, go find towns that have no zoning. So I did, and I'm working in a really lovely town, but as soon as you go from one tiny house on wheels to two, you now have a park, and the manufactured housing park zoning is the, is the, is the culprit. It precludes us from putting that second home there. Our bill will make it happen, and I think a lot of people at a very important health clinic north of us will thank me if we get this bill passed. I wonder, Ben, if you would address the notion, so since I have the mic, I'm, I'm just taking advantage of the moment. So Sylvia Von Avalon, Southern Hampshire Planning Commission. Along with this young man here, why he can't park it in his parents' driveway, and I'm sure your parents would love that. But since we allow accessory dwelling units now, and we've come so far with accessory dwelling units. I don't know that I see a huge jump from an accessory dwelling unit to a tiny house on wheels. And why, why, like for example, I couldn't have some sort of utility hookup allowance to allow someone to pull up on my driveway, if that's my choice, why I couldn't have that work. So I'm just curious about that, you know, dovetailing with existing accessory dwelling unit so in, in my presentation, I talked about um, uh, tiny houses, uh, static tiny houses, that is, tiny houses on permanent foundations as being a possibility of a detached accessory dwelling unit. Just recognize that under the existing ADU law, um, detached ADUs are at the municipality's discretion. The municipality is not required to allow detached ADUs, but they may if they choose to do so. Municipalities are only required to allow attached ADUs. Um, so, with, with re so it really does come down to a question of local regulation. So you, you could, if a municipality allows detached ADUs, it could be a tiny house. Uh, it could, uh, with some modifications to state law, be uh, a tiny house on wheels. Uh, and it could be, could be taxed as, uh, as a unit that's there for occupancy. It could be hooked up to utilities are there, um, it, it does come down to uh, a question uh, in, in the first instance of state regulation dealing with the code, that is, what, what is the code through which these things are being built, or life safety standards. I mean, you're, talk to your fire chiefs people, they, they will go nuts if these things aren't built through some uh, reasonable code, uh, and then the, the question of local zoning. With regard to communities that don't have zoning, um, uh, there is a, I think it's still on the Website. On the OSI, the Office of Strategic Initiatives website, there is a, a map of uh, uh, municipalities in the state that don't have zoning. And I think there are 19 of them. Um, most of them north, but there are a couple. I, I used to be the executive director of the Upper Valley Lake Santa Fe Regional Planning Commission, and two of my communities uh, did not have zoning. Uh, so they're, they're, they are out there, uh, and, I, and I, I'm, I don't think that the the state law on manufactured housing parks would be an issue at the local level if there's not local zoning. Um, so it would really just come down to a question of what kind of septic system can you put in and will it meet the EF standards. We have another question back here. Uh, yeah, just, uh, the, <coughs> yeah you know, the, the reason I kicked off that, um, you know, that uh, conversation on plan link was um, actually about our RVs. You know, when we have uh, a customer that comes up part, part time, um, and, and they are millennials, and, and they like to come up for the weekends. And they and, and they brought a beautiful tiny home on wheels. 
And the fact is, many towns that I'm aware of do allow uh, RVs, you know, for a certain amount of time, three months in a couple of towns if there's um, another building on it, or six months. And that's pretty much their plan. Unfortunately, um, I, I don't see where our zoning in the town I'm working in would allow something like that. And as a result, uh, I went looking a little further, and I said, well, I don't see anything that says I can't do it either. Um, um, and so there's a, and so I was just looking for a little more backup on it. So when I do bring it before the zoning board, I have something to work with. Well, this is this is why we're having this discussion. That's why I'm here. Right. I mean, this this is in development. Um, you know, I think that the, the state there, there are several things that are confronting all the towns, and that is sewage management, taxation, and concerns about how to inspect these. I mean, those are some, some of the, the basis for the concerns, and those are the things that are being developed. And hopefully you'll be talking amongst yourselves and soliciting your constituents for their ideas. Uh, but I truly believe, because I confronted these problems almost every day, sometimes seven days a week, um, that I believe that there are systems that can be put in place that aren't any more onerous than ones that we already have in the way that we handle sewage, et cetera, except that they're a little bit different. And I hope that that being different isn't frightening. Uh, there are thousands of years, or millions of years, of uh, development for reasons why we process sewage the way we do, right? Millions of people have died. There are laws very specific, uh, specifically to, to you know, uh, make, us, make it safe for us, right? So we tiny house folks do not want to turn this around and upend the safety at all. But saying that there are alternatives to this and you know, just like inspecting for life safety issues, how about inspecting uh, alternative systems for sewage, a water connection, a water catchment, et cetera. So the conversation is starting here, and this part of this part of the state with us being here today. And this is really exciting. Hi, um, Helen Monahan, Bradford County Registry of Deeds and Vice President of the New Hampshire Registry of Deeds Association. This question is for the lawyer. So it's real property, taxable as real property. The deed comes up, and then they drive to Colorado. How does this happen? Yeah, there, 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 there would have to be some some mechanism to address that. With the bar or something. There, we, we, we deal with the same thing with manufactured housing, although once they're in place, they're yeah. unlikely to move. But although it's just, you know, I, I work for New Hampshire Housing, uh, and we do single family lending, including manufactured housing. And we had one unit that moved to Vermont. <laughs> we don't have jurisdiction in Vermont. Right. right. And you know, how are we going to foreclose on that? I don't know. Correct. Uh, so that's so why I'm just trying to look ahead. ahead. So right. that, that, that is, uh, it's, um, we, we're already dealing with it with manufactured housing, and I think you'd probably find uh, that tiny house or somebody else could do roughly the same thing. All right, well, that's it. Um, so I just wanted to thank Tim. Do you want to say one? No, please go ahead. I was just going to uh, offer a round of applause. Let's have a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, so much for coming. Obviously, this isn't the end of the conversation. We're going to keep moving. If you haven't signed in, please sign in. And again, we're happy to serve all of those in our, our commission uh, boundaries. And so glad you could make it. And feel free to mingle, grab a bite to eat before you head out. If anyone wants to contact me particularly, I have a clipboard up here, and just sign your name and email address, your role, and how, what kind of help that I can provide. Thank you.